Hang on, let me get a drink of water. I just get a dry mouth. There you go. If I start doing this, it's because I've got a dry mouth. Mm. I had to cut it out so many times when I did the filming for Mind Valley because every so often I'd be just go. <laughs> okay. I might keep this in. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you can keep that in. So, here with Jade Shaw and myself, Thomas Matthias. And um, we are here, uh, we've met each other two weeks ago mm -hmm. at a month of meditation, co living, uh, digital nomad co living here in Portugal, absolutely in a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got to know Jade as uh, a teacher of astral projection and I've got to attend one of your <laughs> workshops here too which was super inspiring yeah. I myself I, I've heard a book I put it on top now because this is the yoga sutras I spoke to you about oh okay yeah I'm very much into yoga and I really love the last chapter of this book which is all about cities which is mm. um, qu uh, qualities that can um, that lean on the um, what we normally would not understand as possible. Yeah. And I'm yeah. fascinated by that personally. And then all of a sudden you appeared and you actually gave me an experience. Ah. Right? Then, <laughs> I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad yeah. I gave you an experience. That's yeah. the key thing to try and rather than tell people about these things or actually give them a feeling embodied experience to some degree. Yeah. Everyone's different. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I basically had an experience where I was tangibly feeling like I was somewhere else and I could touch things. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, uh, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit. Who is Jade Shaw and what is astral uh, projection? What even is it? Yeah, no, it's great. Because I think when, we, when people hear astral projection, sometimes they think of like crazy stuff like They've seen something in a movie, people coming out of their bodies or doing crazy things in astral planes. Um, but actually that's the esoteric term. It's not quite as fantastical as that, although it is very awe-inspiring. So astral projection is the esoteric term for an outer body experience. But what is an outer body experience? It, this depends on the lens that we're looking at it through. So th there's no kind of real right or wrong answer. It depends on the cultural, scientific or neurological lens, for example. So my background is in Western psychology, transpersonal psychology. So I mainly look at it through this lens, through the mind. So they would say it is the feeling or the sensation of shifting out of your physical body. Full on Doctor Strange, if you've seen the movie, where he kind of comes out and he floats around, he sees himself, he's kind of a ghost-like translucent figure and he's like, whoa, and can go and do different things, go on a journey to different places and what might appear to be different realms. So that's the experience, that's what's reported, the phenomenology effectively. Um, now what is happening in psychology is they say our sense of self so where we perceive ourselves to be in time and space, which right now is in this chair, having a chat, but this would be a shift out. So your sense of self is somewhere else, and this could be in the same room, it could be in a different dimension, it might be in a place within this objective reality. Um, it kind of depends on a few things, but I'm not gonna to go too much into the places just yet. Uh, but then for example, in shamanism, they might perceive the spirit leaving the body, and or the soul in spiritualism. So there are some different spiritual traditions that believe soul, spirit, or part of our consciousness is actually to some degree leaving and seeing things in objective reality. Assuming there is an objective reality. Right, so, so you say esoteric traditions believe that? Mm. that, that you're actually in, different, in a different location? Yeah. But science, how does science explain this phenomena? So psychology perceives it's your self-awareness that is having an experience beyond the body. Right. So perceiving, whether it's real right. or not, right. we don't know, but the experience is, and it acknowledges this, you can study this, uh, and I've done research on our body experiences that's peer-reviewed scientifically, where you study people who have the feeling of shifting out of their body. Right. Um, whether or not we don't know what that is, but that's the experience, and it's recognized right. phenomena in science. Right. They say we can study it. Um, psychology, um, some views are that you recreate a reality based on your expectations and predictions and your imagination, um, not dissimilar to dreaming. 
However, I would somewhat disagree with that because when people have an out-body experience, it's considered in Western psychology an exceptional human experience because there's such a radical change. Mm -hmm. A bit like if someone has a DMT, ayahuasca, mm -hmm. plant medicine experience or a near-death experience, there's such a big change than if, oh, I'm just imagining I'm being on a guided journey or I'm um, in my mind somewhere. One of the most commonly reported things is it felt realer than real. That's mm. what most people say. Wow. And they have this knock on effect of change in mm. their lives to some degree. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's also a nice way to enter it because, of course, uh, it will be received with a lot of skepticism by people mm -hmm. like out of body experience, or not believing it, maybe curious, maybe people that are already leaning on the side of, I believe that that is possible. Yeah. But regardless, yeah. it, it is experienced, you know, whether it's yeah. like a dream or not. So that's already a nice starting point to move further from then. So yeah. it's for everyone, whether exactly. you're a skeptic or not. Exactly. If yeah. you do the techniques and you're a skeptic, you're an atheist, you don't believe in anything, which is perfectly fine that you will still have an experience because the techniques work and will give you an out-of-body experience. How we then choose to make sense of it, which is usually from our cultural or religious background, um, for example, yeah, if I'm within a shamanic tradition, I might think, oh yeah, my spirit came out. If I'm in psychology, I might think, oh, I've come out into a wider dimension of my own mind. It doesn't matter which one it is. The point is the transformative effects, which is why it's important not to focus on the mechanism. Okay, how is it happening? What is happening? Is it real? But actually go, what are the benefits? What are the transformative effects? And can it help people? You know, in the same way, you know, meditation can. I love that. I really love that. Um, and that leads actually to something I'm personally interested in, uh, which is uh, because you've also studied this in the context of Tibetan Buddhism, mm. right? So yeah. how do, for example, Tibetan Buddhists um, relate to this? And also leads to a, a, a second question. Why do they do it? Mm. Um, because there are probably benef spiritual benefits to it. So yeah, how do they relate to this experience? What do they believe about it? What okay. do you study with them? And what is their benefit uh, okay. they believe it has? Yes. Yeah. Okay, you ready? We're going to go deep. We're going to talk about death already. Five minutes in, we're going for death. <laughs> Um, the reason why I'm saying that is because within Tibetan Buddhism, it's largely practice for conscious dying. Three things mainly. One, to die consciously and when we enter what they call the bardos on the other side, this next part in our uh, consciousness evolution, which they say is very dreamlike, we can recognize that we're there and then choose where we want to reincarnate or go to. So they say we don't have that awareness usually at the point of death because we dream how we sleep. So if we black out when we sleep, we're just gonna black out at the point of death and have little or next to no awareness and be pulled by what they call the winds of karma into our next lifetime. Whereas if we can be aware and awake and recognize either the clear light, uh, which is a fraction of a second, we haven't got very long to recognize it and get enlightened, um, or you can ride that out and into the bardo state and go, aha, I'm dreaming and the bardo state, uh, when I say dreaming, I mean, it's like a dreamlike state. Like this reality, they say is like a dreamlike state, very real, but dreamlike nonetheless, illusionary, they say. You can then choose where to go and even become enlightened. So mainly conscious dying, but also, this is where it gets a bit sci-fi, um, helping other people that might be stuck in other places, let's say dimensions for lack of a better word, but these are the places, these bardos are dimensions, they see as states as mind, like this is a state of mind. So if people are trapped or held um, by habits and in the essence of their consciousness that is keeping them rigidly attached to something in a certain plane of existence, you can then go in and you can help them move on if you practice astral projection effectively. Uh, so I uh, can interrupt as a access yeah. to subconscious, unconscious parts that we also understand in modern psychology, like parts of our psyche that we normally cannot reach to. They use it to reach into those places. Yeah. From where our deep rooted subtle beliefs and things come to the surface and our habits and stuff. Yes. So they use it to access that. Yes, but these right. are seen as actual places. So not just it's someone's mind and they go in in a psychology kind of way and it's literally they're in another place of existence. So for example, mm -hmm. this would be like a hell type realm. Mm -hmm. But the hell realm is intrinsically 
formulated and connected to the neurosis of the essence of that, let's say, soul, but consciousness that is then reflected in a personified way. Mm. Um, there's a great, I don't know if, actually, I don't know if this is a great metaphor, but I love it. There's a Disney movie called Soul. And in the Disney movie, they uh, go and one of the characters goes into a neurosis and this creates a reality and a plane of existence that's very dark and they become um, really focused in on a, a darkness and then that forms the land around them. So that's a really simplistic way of, of sort of explaining that. But you can then go in and help people shift out of those mm. um, habits. And just in case everyone's freaking out and getting a bit scared, like, like, don't worry, they say, you will always move out of these different types of places because you will exhaust the karma right. of what is holding you there when, when you go through it. By looking at it. By looking at it yeah. and experiencing what needs to be experienced and mm -hmm. felt in mm -hmm. that place. There's a cool story of a Tibetan Buddhist Rinpoche called Mindrilling Rinpoche. And he uh, was he knew he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Rinpoches do this. So when they know they're going to die, they start practicing out-of-body experiences. Because it's the best thing to do for conscious dying. One of the best things. And so he knew he was practicing it and he was on the verge of sleep kind of nodding off but not and people would come he would give them a blessing bonk them on the head with his stick and then kind of go back into this trance like what we call the mind awake body sleep state which is step one to astral projection and he was out of his body down the valley and he saw a group of people coming up the hill he came back to his body and said to his missus um oh the, you need to put the kettle on we'll need six cups of tea and she's like oh okay and then an hour later, six travellers came up the hill and he was able to pour the tea because he came out of his body and he saw that they were there. Right. Um, right. So he was practising to be able to do that when he enters, let's say, the other side or wider consciousness landscapes. Right, yeah. right, right. And these are really the stories that obviously lean more or not even lean, mm. they're on the side of there's actual out-of-body uh, experiences happening. And it's actually a way to be in a different location and perceive something yeah, yeah. so so we we'll call these ob objective reality out-body experiences mm -hmm. so basically you can verify and you can evidence them i mean the cia was doing this back in the 19 late 1970s 1980s they wrote a whole report on it um where they literally say in the report this is not a conspiracy it's on the website you can download it and look for yourself that um you can teleport with your consciousness anywhere in time and space. Hmm. So literally there's a quote in there that says that. Of course, I don't know what their personal experiences was with that. But um, I forgot the question, tell me again. I have ADHD, so halfway through my mind works too fast and I forget stuff. Remind <laughs> me what we were oh, it's, again? It's, it's, we're already rolling in a nice conversation, we can go different directions. But I asked, in this case, uh, when we speak about this, we are clearly speaking on uh, on the side of there's actually an out-of-body oh, yes. experience Objective happening experiences. rather than it's yeah, just yeah. a phenomenon that we acknowledge but it's just a phenomenon we don't know what it is here we are saying it's actually happening yeah it was somewhere else and we can predict things yeah so you can come out of your body go down the road to a street you've never been before so that it can't be in your memory for you to draw and just recreate it you can go to a street go to a car go see what your mate's doing see what they're doing, come back to your body and then verify it to be true. I mean, this is what happened in my life-changing out-of-body experience and which is why I then went and studied it for my master's degree because it blew my mind. I got a door number, came back to my body, went and saw it was the same door number and then I was like, how is that possible? I've never been down the street before. I've never seen this. A skeptic might say, oh, you could have seen it on TV in a clip, and, but no, it, I just knew. So... Yeah, then I wanted to go, well, how the heck is that possible? And that's when I started learning about perception, reality, consciousness, um, and how we interact with it from different lineages, really. So the Tibetan Buddhists, they use astral projection and lucid dreaming as mm. well, which is closely related to it. Yeah. Playing with experiencing things inside our consciousness that mm. are not like here as this reality. Mm. Um, they, so they use it to go into the subconscious and unconscious mind, which they even perceive it as other realms. I've actually uh, studied this, it's super interesting. The six realms of delusion, I'll probably put it down the screen. Uh, it's really fascinating uh, way to understand our own psychology. Yeah. So, but they, they actually believe it's, it's, it's somewhere else, but leaving that aside, um, they use it to enter parts of their subconscious and unconscious mind that are uh, painful that are causing them to 
to loop in bad habits and, mm. and negative thinking mm. and hell and yeah. pain and suffering basically the buddhist idea of overcoming suffering and yeah. becoming a, a bodhisattva someone who can help other humans so this this shows how beneficial astral projection uh, can be so mm. maybe you could go deeper into it because you have a deep sense of mission with this mm. how is this going to help people uh, also outside of the context of Tibet and Buddhism okay. but knowing that they use it for it as well how can people heal themselves yeah. with astral projection uh, there's a few different ways but the one I'm going to focus on because of your question is probably trauma mm -hmm. um, so when you come out of your body you can automatically enter certain spaces that may appear dark and this is what people get scared about uh, you know, where am I going to go, what am I going to experience so it could be dark there's usually a reason for going to that place. We're being taken to that place because there's something we need to face, embrace or heal. And that could be reflected through the landscape itself, like a, a type of hell realm, for lack of a better word. Or it might be that there is a figure or a situation taking place there that is, really, uh, that is connected to a trauma or a fear or linked to something like shame or guilt, something like that. So you can come out of your body and you can either automatically enter these or you can choose to. So you can create a projection plan, which is an intention. What am I going to do? And then you have a motivation. Why am I going to do it? So, for example, you might go, I'm going to come out of my body and I'm going to call to heal my shadow so that I can release some of my trauma. So for those that might be watching, the shadow is anything we've disowned about ourselves or suppressed. And pushed into the shadows our unconscious mind usually related to fear shame or guilt but doesn't have to be often related to trauma that we don't want to bring up it's like everything we hide behind a mask and um, we don't want to show to the world usually our taboos things like that undesirable aspects undesirable aspects of ourselves things that which we perceive to be wrong but aren't necessarily wrong as well and also our divinity and our gifts because there's the golden shadow right so still anything that we've pushed behind, not things that we just perceive to be wrong. It could be our, our pure essence, it could be our untapped potential or talents. Anyway, you come out your body, you can go, I'm gonna, I want to meet or face my shadow and I want to do this to heal my trauma. So that would be the motivation and motivation is the most important thing because it's our reason why, why we're doing this work. Um, so you can come out and you might face something that looks pretty scary. Now, this is where it gets tricky and we get into a, a little bit of a philosophical debate. You can come out into spaces which seem to have what are called thought forms. So these are personified uh, representations in real form like this that are the manifestation of something we need to embody or face or meet. So and it can appear scary, um, but it's because it's part of our shadow and we don't want to face it. So you can come out. You can engage with it, have an encounter, you can say, what do you represent? You can give it a hug, you can um, see what it has to give you, you can say, what do you need from me? What do I need to see? Show me what is within my shadow, or where do you come from? That's a nice easy one, where do you come from? And then something will happen, There'll be, you'll have an inner gnosis, something will shift, you, they might give you something, there might be just a merging of energy where it comes into you and then you wake up and you feel like something shifted in your body um, energetically. So you can do this. This is quite advanced. I usually only teach shadow work through astral projection with intermediate to advanced, unless they're already having spontaneous out of body experiences that appear to be dark and they're scared, which means the shadow wants to be integrated. It's shouting through the out of body experience, mm -hmm. because I believe out of body experiences are a call from the psyche to open up a new path so we can self-actualize a new sense of self into existence. And if, if they're having dark experiences, that's the opportunity for that. That's the gift is to go into it and then see what is there and then to heal that part. Mm -hmm. And some people do have spontaneous, there's three different types, spontaneous, forced and self-initiated. If they're spontaneous, that could be that you're having dark experiences for a reason. And this is a really great way of doing it. But it does take the brain to, to do this kind of work. Like shadow work is, you know, you need a lot of courage and self-compassion. Um, my teacher, William Buhlman, who's one of the top in the world at the Monroe Institute, 
uh, had an experience and he was in a corridor and there was this kind of footsteps walking up. He was out of his body and it walked towards him and it was like a creature with like sloth like arms, this like weird head, uh, very real, not dreamlike at all. Uh, but he, he sensed that it probably wasn't something separate. It wasn't a separate spirit, a separate entity. And he just stood his ground and it walked towards him. He didn't know what to do. He was totally scared, um, but he knew his higher self knew that there was something here. It walked up to him and he just allowed it to merge with him. And then he had this huge release and he woke up and he felt like something had shifted. He said he didn't know what part of his trauma or what part of his shadow that was, but it didn't matter because he knew that he'd integrated something mm -hmm. that took that form quite symbolically as this kind of hideous creature, let's say. Not everybody's shadow is like that, hideous creatures. It could be a landscape. It could be just in a, a situation we enter into. Or a memory. I, I have to yeah. think of, um, it's very fascinating. I, 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 at some point myself, I was looking to heal as quite a specific trauma. And um, I was looking for EMDR because I, was, oh, yeah, I yeah. wasn't getting to it myself. And I ended up in a mushroom ceremony because somehow life brought this forward to me. And, uh, and uh, how the mushroom did its work was it showed me the particular situation with the particular person mm -hmm. that I was having the trauma from. And I could witness the situation in a new perspective and uh, from feeling all the painful feelings, uh, it switched in pure compassion and love in mm. the mushroom ceremony and I healed. Mm. And I could see when you speak about it, that um, an astral projection, successful astral projection could do the exact same thing. Mm. You would revisit a certain memory that you've interpreted in a certain way and re revisit it and release it. Yeah. Right. So we're actually, it's a natural way to yeah. almost get high. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is kind of like a natural way to get high. I mean, some of the studies show that you can have um, the the transformative effects are very similar to the effects of psychedelics, mm -hmm. except you don't need to take psychedelics or drugs to be able to get there. It is quite a challenge to build the skill mm -hmm. because it is a skill. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that someone can give you. It's like if you're going to try and do a pull up you would need to do certain things to build the strength and the technique to do that pull up. So it's the same without body experiences. You have to learn what I call how to ride the bike. You have to learn how to hold the handlebars, steer, manage the pedals and get your balance. Once you've got that, if you have an experience, it can often be incredibly powerful and you only need to really have one powerful experience for to have a lifelong effect. We have some of the science on that. And we're doing sure. a longitudinal test on the same thing, which will be the first in the world. But um, I wanted to say one more thing and it's gone. What were we saying just before this? About uh, being able to look at something through a mushroom ceremony, for example, but being able to do the same thing yes. with ah, yes. astral projection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The only, and the other only difference is that the phenomenology is different. So, for example, you wouldn't say a dream, meditation and a mushroom ceremony are the same thing, right? You go, well, now I'm sitting on a cushion and having some sort of experience, but that's different for me lying in a bed having a dream, and that's different for me like taking mushrooms. In terms of the phenomenology, the experience of it, you know? Setting, yeah. Oh, well, the, the actual experience, it's like, so for example, mushrooms, you might have, you know, you can go into places and crazy patterns, geometric things, and all sorts of stuff. Then meditation might be just you sat there listening to your thoughts. You could obviously see geometric things and patterns going deeper. Um, but the way that they're experienced and felt is different. So with an out-of-body experience, you can do the same thing as any of those, but it's very different. And this is what sets it aside from other experiences, is the radicalness of it, because people freak out as soon as it happens. I taught the cast of um, Behind Her Eyes, which is a hit Netflix show. The main character, Eve, in the workshop, got her head out of her body, was so shocked at how real it was, because you, your head literally goes... <laughs> and you come out, it's not like you're lying there and you go deeper into your mind, you literally have the sensation of coming out and you're like a ghost. Uh, she freaked out and then snapped back to her body, and this is what I mean about it being a skill and a practice, because you have to have calm emotional regulation, otherwise if you get too scared or too excited, you come back, um, and also clarity of awareness. Sometimes people come out of their body and they can't see, then they move and it's like they're really heavy when they move, like they're caramel, 
And so you have to have, um, your awareness has to be quite clear. And this is when, from some of the yogic perspectives, you would work on your chakra system to help with that as well. And yeah. a meditative mind. And a meditative mind. Meditation right. is one of the best things. Right. Meditation and shadow work are the two best things you can do. Because if you're worried about having darker experiences that might naturally come up for you to integrate your shadow, um, if you do it already in the waking state, then you're going to have more of the... Um, or inspiring experiences like flying into the cosmos, meeting dead loved ones, connecting with your higher purpose, um, in some shamanic circles, connecting with your power animal, whatever it might be, but in a very real felt sense way. Yeah. So, where do you hope um, astral projection will go? worldwide what do you hope mm. to do with astral projection in the world what do you think it can how it can change the world basically astral projection can change the world through through many ways but the three scientific ways that we know are through three things and i'll just touch on them briefly because there's quite a lot of meat to each one so one is reducing the fear of death almost all people when they have the experience they lose the fear of death or if not it's radically reduced we know this, we've got some studies on this, and there was even a virtual reality out-of-body experience study in Barcelona that gave people a fake out-of-body experience. It was just a headset seeing a virtual reality of themselves in front, and they still had a reduced fear of death, and that wasn't even a real one. It was just one that was mimicked. So um, the reason why that is because self-identification shifts from the physical body to something bigger than themselves. So people make sense and go, I am a soul, I am a spirit, I am consciousness. When I die, I will go back to the universe. Whatever they believe, but they do not believe ultimately they are their physical body. And then there's a knock-on effect from the fear of death. Now, why is that going to change the world? That sounds like it just helps one person, right? Um, and this is where I was going to say it gets meaty, so I'm just going to touch on it. So much of our prejudice, racism, sexism, and the other one, can't remember, uh, often come down to a fear of death. And when people fear death, they cling to belonging, a sense of strong identification, certain groups of people to be seen and heard. I am here, I am alive, I am mortal. Um, so this is why you're more likely to be more, more racist, have more hatred for people, cling to your values and your nationality if you, um, if you, fear the, if you have a fear of death. And we all do. There's a famous uh, lecturer that speaks about this called Nathan Heflick, and he says the USA in particular and the UK are death-denying cultures, mm -hmm. um, which is really bad because if we deny death, we don't live. And Bronnie Ware is a really cool nurse, and she spent her all of her career listening to the dying wishes of people in the last two weeks of their life. And she said, she wrote a book called uh, The Five Regrets of the Dying, I think it's five, and some of them were, I wish, I wish I'd lived a life true to myself, I wish I'd stay connected to my friends, I wish I'd something to do with having more courage to do what I want. And then there's a couple of others at the same. And every single person at some point on their deathbed, the last two weeks of life, went through those things. So if you reduce the fear of death through embracing it to some degree, you're more likely to not have these regrets because you're going to live the life that you want to live. Um, so reducing the fear of death. And the second one is the experience of awe. So all has loads of health benefits. Can I tap something into the fear of death? Because yeah, I think yeah. it's super interesting because I think what an out-of-body experience can show people is, uh, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't had a, a strong awakening through one, but I can imagine they just, you kind of already mentioned it, they realize yeah. I'm consciousness. I am mm. something deeper than this body because yeah. it's a very similar symptom, almost you could say, to people that have a non-dual mm. realization uh, that find that they begin to grasp what the yoga books mean when mm. they say you're not the body, you're not the, not the mind, you're the consciousness, mm. it's beyond it. Yeah. It's the same symptom, you lose your fear of death. Yeah. Because you see the body dies, the mind dies, Yes. perhaps, whatever that means, maybe it transforms. Yeah. But what I am, ultimately, is completely safe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's very, ni very nice to see that that's so similar. Yeah. 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 No, you've hit the nail on the head, it's spot on. Um, the, the experience of psychedelics and awakening experiences um, and near-death experiences had crossover effects. Yeah, yeah, Similar yeah. things. They show something similar. Yeah. yeah. Or they show the same thing in a different 
way. Yeah. So anyways, yes, and the first one, the fear of death. The, losing the fear of death or yeah. radically reduced fear of death. And we can go into civilizations in terms of how it's going to impact the world as well. Into like Ernest Becker, the, the Pulitzer Prize winner who wrote The Denial of Death. He did a whole book on, on how Freud was wrong about sex and actually death is the most suppressed thing that humans have. And then how that shows up with war, building monuments so we can live, man can live forever. I won't go into it too much, but yeah. Then all... The experience of awe is the number one thing people report, is that they have this huge experience at the power of awe and they have, there's loads of health benefits. Or they've started prescribing awe because it reduces inflammation of like some of the awe. main diseases. Awe. Like being the feeling awe. of awe. Like, it'd be like the wonder? Yeah, yeah. For everything is? Yeah, right. A-W-E. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The feeling of awe. Um, because it radically reduces inflammation in Alzheimer's, cancer, and diabetes. Mm. So th that's funny. So you, you're saying like the, the feeling of awe is so good for your physical health. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the science on that. And yeah. not only that, so that's for yourself again, isn't it? But how can it change the world? It, it's, there are, again, studies that show that it makes you more compassionate, more charitable, more of a team player. So you're more likely to have higher levels of openness, which means slightly more accepting uh, of people and yeah, higher compassion. So experiences of all really good for you. And then the third is insight and knowing. So getting insights that you would not normally be able to access and knowing certain qualities about yourself, your mind, we've touched on this, so I won't go into too much detail, um, that then shape your life and open up pathways or possibilities that you would never even knew existed until you had that particular realization. Um, and the indigenous cultures have been using polyphasic perception, which is what astral projection is, uh, to get insight and knowing for many, many years. So polyphasic perception is basically different ways of knowing through altered states. So psychedelics, meditation, dreaming, even if you know when you have a shower and you get an idea in the shower and you're oh my God, I've just had a creative idea. You've probably slightly gone into a altered state and entered polyphasic perception and then got the idea, got the insight. Another cool one is all the Silicon Valley people that use flow states. It's the same thing, it's a form of polyphasic perception. Different brain waves. Yes, yeah. accessing different brain that waves. That you can also measure. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Scientifically, easily. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. easily, I don't know, but there are scans, <laughs> there are scans for it at least. Yeah. You can show the brain waves are vibrating in a sort of length and they create insights. Yeah. Uh, or whatever, Whoa. flow states. Yeah, I didn't actually know that with some of that, so that's cool. But yeah, exactly. So yeah. you can get these uh, these other ways of knowing. And so that's cool for you, for your sense of self, what you want to do in life, your purpose, if you want to know stuff about your relationship, or you want to heal grief. Um, however, how is it going to help change the world? Just having increased polyphasic perception or access to it. Um, this is cool. There is a direct correlation between countries that have chosen monophasic perception which is what a lot of the western ones have done including the uk meaning that we don't value we don't use we don't access all of these different altered states such as out of body experiences that can give us polyphasic perception because of that i believe there's a direct correlation to mental health because if like many indigenous communities you can access your dreams you can access insights you can connect with what you perceive to be your divine uh, spiritual sense of self you are a more holistic more whole more human because it is a human uh, it's a human quality to be able to enter altered states which we've we've got rid of in the west then it's going to affect your mental health because you're not going to know why maybe you've got that illness you're not going to know how you can access your trauma because you're not using these altered states which you need you, that could be debatable but i think you need them to be able to go into the depths to see what's there to bring forward your ultimate potential and healing really so oh and that's what i wanted to mention the study there is a direct correlation between polyphasic perception cultural diversity and um, environmental um, looking after the environment so uh, Erica Borgenin did a study that looked at those countries that had higher levels of perceptual diversity, had um, more likely able to look after their environment, have a connection to nature, look after the land and cultivate it, whereas the ones that were monophasic that don't do any of this stuff uh, were more not likely to look after their environment. Mm. So environmentally, it's better for the world if we are polyphasic. More connection. 
exactly to what's important exactly yeah. <laughs> um we have uh, about five more minutes so um time for the last questions <gasps> the last <coughs> questions let's go let's go uh i think it's interesting um to 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 answer maybe the questions that you receive most commonly about yeah. it for people that are you know hearing about it for the first time perhaps um mm. might raise concerns or just curiosities what are some of the most common questions that you could uh, answer briefly for these okay. people yes some of the most common questions one can anybody do it or is it for special people Yes, everybody can do it. It's a human experience. If you are human, which I'm assuming we all are, I mean, who knows, but I'm assuming we are, um, you can do it. You have the qualities too. Everyone's slightly different, like learning a new skill. Everyone will take time because they have different qualities of mind to work on, but everybody can do it. Second one, will I come back to my physical body? Yes, there's a very long answer to this, which depends on context and what we believe but short answer yes you will always come back to your physical body just look at it this way at some point your biology is going to need to go to the toilet so as soon as you feel like you need to go for a wee or a poo it's going to bring you back yeah because you're going to feel that in your inner system and another common question is um can i evidence it can i leave my body find something come back to it and then see that it's real i've actually entered this subjective ordinary everyday reality Yes, you can. As I mentioned earlier, you could get a door number, car number. Um, you could go and visit a friend. Obviously, this is quite a controversial answer saying, yes, you can, because it depends on a lot of factors. But try it out. If you don't believe me or you're not sure, or you're just thinking, is it even real? Go and try it and then share with me your stories. Because there's some really cool ones about people evidencing and then having a mind-blown epiphany. And I'm not sure of any of the ones. Are there any that you think maybe to ask hmm. that people might be interested in. Connecting to your purpose is another one. Can I find out what I'm here to do or what I need to do next, which is possible as well. Maybe if it takes a lot of practice. I, I, can, I remember when mm. I first heard about it, because I heard about it before, and then years for years, I didn't think about it so much until uh, I met you two weeks ago. Um, but I was very interested in it when I first heard about yeah. it. And, uh, but it was in a time where I was not meditating much yet and uh, it felt undoable. So I felt I needed a lot of practice and it kind of then um, appeared yeah. to the uh, background. Um, so maybe people would not get yeah. into it because I think it's going to take a lot of effort. Yeah. Practice, uh, would you say that's a valid concern? Or is there a way for these people to access something quickly? Yeah. You, there is quicker ways to access it. So two things there, both yes and no. They, uh, it depends on the person's psychology, their own mind. Uh, so for example, if you have a high absorption rate, you can easily absorb into an experience. Like if you cry at an advert or a film, or you're easily hypnotizable, you're more likely to have, um, have a high level of openness and then be able to do it. Same if you practice meditation, because you're more likely to be able to focus and calm your emotions when you start feeling all of the different sensations that come with what we call a vibrational state, which is before you leave the body. Um, so these things can really help. It can take up to, depending on the person, a couple few days to a month to six months to a year. So it just, it just depends. Right. It is a skill. It is a city superpower. So, you know, I tend to feel like personally, the greatest things and the most amazing things in life just don't tend to come like sure, that. Sure, You know? Maybe you can also approach it like do a, uh, maybe if you are about to embark on a meditation journey, you do your first year of like spiritual practice yeah. and then see again how it works for you, right? Yeah. 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 Because that's this time I had an immediate experience with you during the workshop. Yeah, that's yeah. probably because of all of your practice though and work with altered states, I imagine. I think so, yeah. yeah. Because then, then yeah. you are, your, I think if your mind is too, too busy, it will be very hard yeah. to, because you're, it's, it's fragile, right? Like yeah. you said, like when you have to need to go to the loo, it, it takes you out of it. So it's just, the mind is talking, talking, talking. Yeah. And my, my, my talking was still taking me out of it as well. Mm. So. Exactly. Um, but there's also easy ways you can access it. I call it, I talk about state stacking. So you can stack states. So for example, you can use biohacking, NLP, self-hypnosis, visualization, yoga nidra, um, what else? Embodiment work. 
So rather than just doing one thing, you can actually increase your chances by adding more ingredients to the mix. Some teachers believe you should practice one thing and work on that, but I'm a big fan of state stacking because sure. most people want to do it quickly, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is the easiest way is to create the uh, Goldilocks conditions, you know, just the right amount of different things that's going to help to create that. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Last question. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. That's and, okay. Uh, I hope people will get to experience some of your <laughs> workshops sometime. Yes. Um, and what do you have coming up? And where can people find you? Yes. So I have a, a three-hour workshop coming up for complete beginners. Um, if you can't, if you can't come, if you miss it, it's okay. I'll be doing another one in the summer. But I'm also doing an event on the connection between psychedelics and out-of-body experiences with some of the best neuroscientists, consciousness researchers, psychedelic researchers, and shamans in the world. It's going to be amazing. If you're interested in these, you can drop me an email at info at jadeshaw.com or you can add me on Instagram, Jade Shaw Fisher, um, or check out my website. But I, I'm really bad at technology, so I never update my website, but there's some information on there, which is jadeshaw.com. Yay! 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 Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.